Um, it just flipped. Okay, well, uh, welcome everybody. Um, it is uh, my great pleasure to introduce Professor Kranos Williams um, to give this uh, pioneer uh, seminar at the Institute for Genomic Biology. Um, Kranos is joining us from uh, North Carolina State University, uh, where he's a professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer um, Engineering. Uh, he also got his PhD um, from NC State, and prior to that, his bachelor's in uh, North Carol uh, from North Carolina A and T uh, State University. Um, I'd like to highlight that both of his degrees are in electrical engineering, um, and so um, he brings um, an engineer's toolbox uh, to the challenges of uh, plant science and um, genomic biology um, in general. Uh, reflecting that, he's uh, the platform director for the data-driven plant sciences platform uh, at NC State. Um, he's also been uh, selected for the National Academy of Engineering Frontiers of Engineering Symposium and the Alcoa Foundation um, Research Achievement Award. <clears throat> um, his research group is, is highly collaborative. They perform uh, multidisciplinary research focused on the development of targeted computational and analytical solutions for modeling and controlling biological systems. Uh, the solutions they develop are used to build and strengthen the transition from large scale, high throughput omics data um, to highly connected uh, kinetic models. And so um, uh, I think his work uh, intersects with a, a lot of projects we have um, going on around campus um, and uh, a lot of work for, for many faculty in, in, in different departments. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to the seminar. Um, so welcome from all of us, Kranos, and um, we look forward to hearing you talk about computational intelligence and machine learning approaches for modeling plant systems within and across biological scales. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Um, thank you for the, the kind introduction. Um, and I'm really um, look forward to, to this talk and thank you for overall the invitation. Um, so like Andrew said, uh, really what I'm, I'm wanting to go over today are some of the various approaches and projects that we've worked on um, in my lab at NC State. So I am the director of the Envisys Lab. Um, you know, we've created that acronym so long ago, I oftentimes forget what it even stands for. Um, so I always have to kind of flash it up on the slide just to make sure that I get it right. Um, it's really pulling, you know, a couple of letters from this general idea of what we do, which is developing engineering, uh, compu engineering computation and analytical methodologies for multi-hierarchical biological systems. But what does this all mean? It really can be uh, summarized in our lab mission, which is to advance a comprehensive understanding of emergent properties of biochemical pathways associated with plant growth, development, adaptation, and adaptation using multi-scale systems modeling. And really as an electrical engineer, our goal is to pull from the wide variety of tools um, that either exist or even develop new tools that really help us to understand how to model biological processes across scale. And really the potential of being able to do this really lends toward addressing some of the more uh, difficult and potentially wicked problems um, in uh, the biological arena, which is to improve tolerance of crop parents to pathog pathogens, um, all the way to increasing bioefficiency, uh, including the increasing the efficiency of biofuel production from plant biomass. So really our long-term goals and where I see the long-term goals of this type of work is really advancing translation um, in plant sciences research and advancing that through the development of tools needed to accelerate the next revolution of agriculture data analytics. Um, this will not only require uh, collaborations across many groups, but also require the development again of these tools to really understand and address these long term problems. And again, not much, not unlike many of the various initiatives, initiatives that have taken place at the University of Illinois. Um, in terms of our long term goal, uh, we really want to push and accelerate discovery, innovation, and translation in not only basic plant science research, but applied plant science research through integrate innovations in these various areas. And what I really see the Embassy's lab as is as enucleating efforts in various types of uh, technologies, such as uh, sensor development, uh, high throughput phenotyping, 
uh, automated acquisition of plant sciences uh, data at scale, uh, whether it's from the lab, data from the lab to the greenhouse, all the way up to the field. The development of customized workflows for efficient management of heterogeneous agricultural data and the development of common analytical environments for multi-scale modeling and data discovery. Now, one of the critical paths here is really moving towards the development of the necessary computational approaches to address the challenges associated with analyzing and understanding heterogeneous agricultural data. So what do we mean by this? We mean in terms of doing this, there needs to be the development of various types of approaches that understands data across various or many different biological scales of abstraction. And this includes uh, data that's generated at the molecular level, all the way to the tissue level, organism level, and even understanding the extrinsic factors that influence these biological systems. Now, there are wealths of data that can be generated across these different levels of scale. And with that comes not only the underlying challenges associated with understanding these data, but also the underlying questions that can be answered, that can be asked and answered. And if we're able to generate the tools necessary to be able to address these challenges, this will uh, lead to uh, new efforts and new directions in not only basic plant science research in terms of new scientific knowledge and new research questions, but also in terms of applied plant science research in terms of improved decision support and addressing aspects uh, to be able to reduce economic loss. So in these areas uh, in the Embassy's lab, we've worked on several different projects. And today I'm just gonna give you an example of some of the specific projects and some of the things that we've been able to do. So we've worked on projects related to root growth and development where we've identified approaches for formulating dynamic models of the expression or the transcriptome response uh, of Arabidopsis in response to iron deficiency and looked at computer vision approaches for being able to analyze microscopy images over space and time. We've also developed predictive models of the lignin biosynthesis system to better understand not only plant cell wall formation, but also understand how various transgenic modifications lead to or influence various types of wood traits. And we've also looked at large scale uh, data analytics projects where we are formulating uh, through the integration of um, various types of tools, uh, developing a data integration, analytics and decision support platform for improving productivity, quality and value of specific crops. In this case, using sweet potato as uh, the uh, specific use case. So I'm just gonna to touch on some of these projects and some of the things that we've been able to do and some of this, the findings that, that we've identified. So in terms of this first project, I'm gonna go over some of the methodology associated uh, with, that we put in place for the dynamic modeling of uncharacterized regulatory components that influence uh, iron homeostasis in Arabidopsis thaliana. So in this case, we know that iron itself, uh, iron deficiency is a global problem. It's a global health problem. And it really affects uh, some of the more vulnerable members of society, including children, pregnant uh, women, and the elderly. And really the goal here is to not only understand um, the influence of iron deprivation, but really understand the mechanisms by which plants absorb iron and also the mechanisms by which it's able to produce various levels of iron. And if we're able to do this, a better understanding of the underlying molecular mechanisms behind iron uptake and iron homeostasis will allow for the production of plants with increased nutritional content and increased tolerance to poor nutritional nutrient soil conditions. Now, much work has been done in this area in terms of understanding key factors that are responsible for the iron deprivation response, including the identification of several transcription factors that are key in terms of the uh, long term outcome in response to iron. And much people have done work in this area, including one of my collaborators, Dr. Terry Long, who in particular have identified specific transcription factors, in this case, Popeye and Brutus, that if knocked out, could either lead to plants that are less tolerant to iron deficiency or more tolerant to iron deficiency. 
Additional work has been done to identify uh, other modulating transcription factors that indirectly influence these specific FA response genes. Um, and through work in collaboration with uh, Dr. Terry Long, uh, we combined computational and experimental approaches to identify key transcription factors um, that were identified to modulate, again, these FA response genes. And other work include work by Zhang et al. to also identify other transcription factors. What, however, has not been or was not known is how all of these things come together, specifically how these modulating transcription factors, if modified or change, influence these known iron response genes. So some of the key questions that we initially had was to one, address to what extent could we create a dynamic mathematical model that characterized the effects of these modulating transcription factors on known FE deprivation response genes? Can we identify an appropriate model structure? Can we assess the extent to which the current experiments we had, were they able to actually allow us to identify an adequate model? And if not, could we identify what additional data would be needed? And then could we move forward with a model identification platform to then uh, assess how combinatorial knockouts um, actually um, modulate the overall response of the effort response genes and actually verify or validate whether or not the model were able to predict the outcomes correctly. So in terms of the overall framework, we first needed to conceptualize the factors that would influence not only the modulating transcription factors, but also the FA response transcription factors. And this included things such as constituent transcription, degradation, and also the influence of other transcription factors on that particular gene. We also incorporated what we deemed as a, the effects of other iron deprivation related effects or other iron deprivation things that would influence gene expression. We then translated this, this conceptual idea to a mathematical equation where we captured this notion of other effects um, due to iron as using a very simplistic assumption. We assume that to be a monotonic signal, um, so monotonically rising, that had an amplitude, uh, a delay in which it rises over time, and a rise rate. Uh, we use this as a simplifying assumption, um, in, and in this case, hoping to simplify or reduce the number of parameters that we had. So thus now we had mathematical equations for both the modulating transcription factors and the effort response genes. We combined this with data that we were able to capture using QRT-PCR experiments where we ended up with a time course where we measured gene expression at 0, 12, 24, 36, 48, 60, and 72 hours. And the idea here was to take this model structure in combination with the uh, data to be able to estimate the parameters of our system. Now, what we found was using uh, profile likelihood, which is an approach for assessing how identifiable a system is, we found out that uh, several of the parameters were literally unidentifiable. In other words, we didn't have enough data to be able to estimate those parameters. And those parameters were the degradation rate and the rise rate associated with the unknown FE signal. So now before coming to any conclusions on that, what we needed to do was to run a sensitivity analysis to assess which one of these parameters actually influenced the system. And what we found was that of those two parameters, of those two sets of parameters, the system was not very sensitive to the rise rate of this unknown signal, but it was particularly sensitive to the degradation rate. So which meant that we needed additional information, we needed additional data to be able to better determine this degradation rate. And because the system was insensitive to the rise rate, we could actually set that to a parameter or to a value without having much influence on the system. So due to this conclusion, we ran additional experiments where we could actually estimate a range or a distribution of the degradation rate of all of the genes within the system. Um, using cordycypin, we ran experiments where we essentially stopped 
um, transcription and then measured or approximated the degradation rate of the corresponding transcripts. This allowed us to get uh, a priori knowledge on the distribution of the degradation rates of the parameters within the system. And then in running back through the profile likelihood analysis, we were then able to identify that doing that in combination with setting a value for the rise rate allowed the parameters, allow us to assess that the parameters were now identifiable. So now putting all of these things together, we had our model, we have our additional data, and we have a priori distributions of our parameters, whether through additional experiments, such as the um, uh, uh, measurements of the degradation rate, or through the utilization of flat priors, we then performed a parameter estimation approach using MCMC. Now, this is a stochastic sampling approach that allows us to take something like in blue, which is an a priori distribution, and then go through the estimation process to come up with an a posteriori distribution, which hopefully has less uncertainty than the original um, range of values that we have. These results here show in blue or in red, the prior distributions, and in blue, the a posteriori distributions one, once running through MCMC. And what we're able to see here is that through this process, we were able to, in most cases, reduce the overall uncertainty associated with the estimated parameters, and then using the a posteriori distributions, come up with simulations of our overall system. And doing this for both the modulating transcription factors and the known FE transcription factors. So now with our model and our a posteriori parameters, we wanted to actually test this. Look at this under um, single mutant responses and double mutant responses and assess whether or not we could actually assess the underlying impact on the FE response genes. So now in looking at these results, the um, shaded areas are correspond to the overall simulations of the uncertain parameters and the asterisks um, correspond to the experimental data. And we see under single mutant experiments, we were actually able to, again, have consistent results that were lined up with the experimental data that we had. In terms, oh, and also, I mentioned before the um, function associated with indirect or unknown influences, and we actually were able to test that. Um, we identified that um, in the literature, there were actually other factors that influenced some of these genes, particularly FIT, which was not on the original microarray chip, and so thus was not originally incorporated into the model, and also BHLH115, which through the literature was seen to influence MIP10 and MIP72. And the question was whether or not this unknown function or the range of this unknown function, whether it matched these factors that were not originally incorporated into, mo into the model, specifically the influence of uh, BHLH115 and the influence of FIT. And through measurements of FIT and the uh, simulations of BHLH115, we see here that the blue shaded area, which corresponds to the district or the range of uncertainty associated with the unknown function, that it actually matched those characteristics of those genes, um, those transcription factors that influenced MIP10 and MIP72, which tells us that our route of using this unknown function um, to be able to capture at least trends of things that are influencing was actually quite accurate. And we also then ran uh, simulations of um, double mutants. And we see here that out of all of the experiments that we ran, five out of the ten, six double mutants uh, predictions that we had were actually consistent with the experiments. Where here, these plots show um, the single um, uh, single um, experiments, single mutant experiments, and in blue shows the double mutant experiments. And we can see that for these results shown here, we actually see consistent results. So in terms of the conclusions and takeaways from this analysis, um, we were able to identify a framework for capturing the structure and range of parameters associated with this um, regulatory network. Um, we were able to put together a framework that helped to identify additional data that was needed and use those data to then 
uh, estimate ranges of the parameters using MCMC and then characterize the overall dynamic response of the system. And we were able to validate aspects of this um, by predicting the impact of double mutants on specific FA response genes. Another study that we looked at um, really tried to ask the research question, can we assess or even quantify the types of interactions that exist uh, between different stresses that are imposed on uh, specifically Arabidopsis and whether or not we can assess this level of interaction as it relates to root growth and cell division. Now, in this particular case, we know that heat stress in particular has various influences or impacts on, in this case, Arabidopsis, which includes impaired photosynthesis, reduced primary root growth, and cytotoxic accumulation of react reactive oxygen species. We know also that iron deprivation also has an impact on reduced primary root growth um, due to the trading off of primary root growth for lateral root growth, and also impairs chlorophyll biosynthesis. Now, what we also know is that stresses, even though these have been identified, stresses, particularly in real life environments, do not occur in isolation. And the question is, can we assess when a plant is exposed to multiple stresses? Is there a level of combinatorial effect? Do we still see these types of effects, effects that occur under the single stresses? And can we quantify any changes in that in any significant way? Well, one way to do this would be to take the combinatorial stress and identify a proxy, something that can be measured under the different conditions, whether it's the control, the single stress conditions, and or the combined stress conditions. The idea then is to then assess the differential effect to the control. How much different is the single stress from the control and how much different is the combined stress from the control? And then the idea is based on that quantification, can we classify the level of interaction? Do we see something that's additive, basically something that looks like a combined differential effect? Or do we see something that's synergistic, something that appears to be more than the combined effect? Or do we see something that's antagonistic, which is something that is less than the combined effect? So key questions that we wanted to ask here is, can we develop a computational approach to assess this combinatorial effect? Can we quantify how this changes over time? And based on assessing these differences, can we identify specific regions in time that would really serve to guide future experiments for a high throughput transcriptomic analysis? So this work was in collaboration with Dr. Ross Zani, who is in the Plant and Microbial Biology Lab at NC State. Uh, she and her lab created um, what's called the Magic Growth Chamber, which allowed us to, through um, light sheet technology, image uh, plant roots over an extended period of time. We use here a light sheet on um, microscope or light sheet microscope to be able to reduce uh, photo induced cellular toxicity and floor for bleaching. Um, and it al also allowed us to image roots over an extended period of time. Through the acquisition of these images, we then used uh, the BioVision tracker, a system or an approach, computer vision approach that was developed in my lab to then quantify changes in gene expression um, over time and space. In terms of the experimental setup, um, like I mentioned before, we had these three experimental conditions. We use cyclone B11 as the proxy, which we use cyclone B11 because of its involvement in cell division and hence root growth. Uh, we were able to image the plant roots at 20 minute intervals, acquiring both the fluorescent channel and the bright fill channel. And using the BioVision tracker that we developed, we were able to do things like track the um, plant root um, itself. We were also able to uh, identify uh, areas of fluorescence, um, basically the expression of cyclin B11. Over this time course, we were also able to use image registration to track specific regions of gene expression, correlating uh, the location of one um, area to the location of another area in the subsequent time points, and actually able to do this over time. Let's see. So now with that, we were able to more broadly capture the changes in not only root growth and the root growth rate of uh, the uh, cell root of the plant roots under these different experimental conditions.
And through our initial analysis, we were able to see that in terms of the overall root growth, we had uh, root growth that were very different under the single stress conditions um, with respect to the control. But with regards to the com combined stress condition, we saw an effect that was not as different as the results for the single stress. Now, this showed us a uh, large scale effect on overall root growth, but we wanted to assess whether or not we were seeing similar characteristics in terms of the underlying gene expression and underlying biological biomolecular mechanisms. So thus we used um, our ability to image cycling B11 um, to be able to do this. And as I mentioned before, um, using again, a combination of the fluorescent channel and the bright field channel, we were able to uh, generate a uh, measurement system, a coordinate system that allowed us to characterize not only the presence and the absence of gene expression and tracking it over time, but doing this um, with respect to specific locations in the plant root. And through this, we were able to generate both spatial and temporal metrics um, associated with the regions of gene expression. So for example, we were able to identify things like persistency, which is how long a specific region of expression stayed around over the corresponding time course. With this, we were able to acquire nine different uh, spatial and temporal metrics. And what we then wanted to do was to characterize the overall effect in this nine dimensional space. To do this, we identified the difference under given conditions. So in this case, this corresponds to the difference in heat versus the combined stress. And through that difference, we were able to generate a corresponding one, uh, the one dimensional signal um, that corresponded to the squared difference. And then we were able to add these differences across the squared differences of all of the corresponding metrics. We were then able to do this over all time. And in this case, this was over a 24 hour period of imaging. And what we were able to assess here was the curve associated with the differential effect with respect to heat and the control, the differential effect with respect to iron deprivation and the control and the differential effect with respect to the combined stress and the control. Now, in summing these time signals, uh, the results are shown here in this bar graph. And we see here that this is the differential effect associated with uh, iron and the control. This is the differential effect with regards to heat and the control. And the yellow is the differential effect with regards to the combined stress and the control. And what we see here, if going back to the comparison that I made earlier, the underlying effect of the combined stress is far less than what you would expect um, when you look at combining the effect of heat and heat and combining the effect of iron deficiency, which allowed us to conclude that somehow there is this antagonistic effect in terms of the response of the plant to both heat and iron deprivation. So we don't see something that is a combined um, overall effect, but somehow aspects of what is being um, influenced in the plant is somehow being negated by introducing both, uh, both stresses. So thus, this allowed us to conclude that the root growth assay suggests antagonism between the corresponding stresses and high dimensional dissimilarity measures um, of cyclin B11 and spatial temporal data suggest this antagonism. And we were able to show metrics that provide insight into this, where now we could actually take these time signals of this differential effect with respect to the control and look at specific time points where this differential was maximal. And in this case, this was really over the about mm, seven hour period to the about 15 hour period. And this really serves as a primary candidate window for taking um, RNA-seq measurements to really elucidate and identify the underlying mechanisms that are contributing to this difference in um, overall impact of the combinatorial stress. So a third project that we worked on really looked at the um, plant cell wall and really looking at building a predictive model um, of lignin biosynthesis and better understanding how changes uh, in specific uh, monolignal genes influenced uh, wood traits. 
This work really started with a collaboration um, with Jack Wang, Vincent Chang, and Ron Sederoff in the Biotechnology Forestry Department at NC State, where we wanted to basically take this uh, known model of lignin biosynthesis and really convert this into a multi-scale model that captured aspects of transcription, uh, protein generation, uh, the production of metabolites, leading all the way to wood traits. And some initial work was uh, done um, in 2008 under the collaboration with, again, um, the Bioforce Technology Group. And what we wanted to do was to extend this work. Um, more specifically, we wanted to uh, improve our uh, transcription model by incorporating uh, indirect influences that would hopefully allow us to better predict the protein concentrations or enzyme abundances that then served as inputs to the metabolic pathway. We also wanted to um, uh, identify alternative machine learning approaches uh, such as a random forest for better capturing non-linearities associated with the outputs of the flux model and use that random forest model to be able to predict um, one of the 25 lignin and wood traits. In terms of the overall data that we used, um, we acquired um, uh, transcriptome data uh, from uh, transcriptome transgenic experiments involving the knockdown of 21 lignin specific genes. Um, we also, through the development of uh, the model for these interactions, made specific assumptions about the types of interactions that could occur, uh, which helped us to constrain aspects of the model. We also had um, measurements of these from these transcriptome experiments, uh, measurements of various bioenergy traits, um, such as sugars, physical characteristics like height, diameter, volume, uh, sacrification efficiency, lignin characteristics like lignin content, et cetera, um, totaling 25 in total. So now in terms of our initial model for the transcriptome part, um, again, we wanted here to use a sparse maximum likelihood approach to be able to estimate these parameters. We assumed that all of the transcripts and the enzymes could be formed uh, using this linear combination where the uh, parameters B served as an indication of the influences across or interactions across these different components. Uh, we made specific assumptions such that a specific component could not contribute to itself. Um, so thus, such that we wouldn't end up with an identity matrix as a solution. Um, so thus we constrained the diagonal of B, this interaction matrix to be zero and assume obviously that there was some level of noise associated with the process as well. And using a maximum likelihood um, estimation approach, we were able to estimate values of this matrix B. And through the estimation of that matrix B, we were then able to then use that to then uh, identify in silico uh, simulations of specific knockdowns. This would allow us to identify a targeted knockdown and set a specific value, and then use this equation um, to then estimate the other values of the components within the system. So now we then wanted to then see or assess or compare, I should say, the uh, extent to which this new model was able to better predict the corresponding wood traits um, compared to the other model, the old model, which did not incorporate these uh, indirect influences and made the assumption that the proteins for a given enzyme only depended on its own transcripts. Again, we wanted to use a random force model. So we trained a random force model using the experimental um, enzyme, enzyme concentrations um, and linking those to the corresponding wood traits. So now using this trained random force model, and looking at these two different scenarios, we wanted to then assess the overall um, outcomes of the results. And what we found was that using these indirect influences, uh, we were able to get better predictions on 23 of the 25 lignin and wood traits, where we either obtained or we obtained a lower sum of squared error and a higher R squared in terms of predicting the experimental values. We also see here that in performing simulations um, over in silico knockdowns from a wild type values of which will correspond to this 100, so this is 100% of wild type, all the way down to 0% um, of wild type, which is a 
close to a complete knockdown. Um, and we looked at this for both the old transcript model and the new transcript model. And what we were able to see is that the transcript model was actually necessary to be able to accurately predict the corresponding lignin traits. Um, where the new model results are in black, the um, old transcript model results are in gray, and the red correspond to the experiment measurements that we actually had. And we saw that this was relatively consistent across many of the traits that we had. Now, the key aspect of this model is not just to compare with the experiments that we already did, but to be able to test new experiments and identify potential knockdowns in silico that could then be tested experimentally. And what we're able to show here are simulated uh, knockdowns of the PAL family and the CoAMT family from again, 100% uh, of wild type all the way down to zero. And then really look at the trade-offs um, that these knockdowns have in terms of influencing things like lignin content um, and also influencing things like physical characteristics. And as you see here, the spots in red, for example, we're able to get a, again, sub substantive knockdown of lignin content while not um, having too much detrimental impact on things like height and wood density. And this corresponded to a knockdown range of about 5% to 25% of both PAL and CoAMT respectively. So thus we could use this type of model to explore different combinations of knockdowns and then you know, translate that to the shaping of experimental specifications. So through this work, we were able to develop a multi-scale model that combined various types of omics data to really go from um, being able to set specific schema for the types of knockdowns that we want and overall predict aspects of the um, bioenergy traits. And we were able to identify something that was really consistent with the experiments that uh, we obtained. And this is really part of some ongoing collaborations um, with Jack Wang and NC State, where we're now looking at using CRISPR to assess the extent to which uh, some of these novel knockdown combinations lead to improved um, wood characteristics, such as reduced lignin and um, reduced impact on physiological traits. All right, so the last project that I wanna talk about today is really a larger scale agronomic project where we're, we're looking at incorporating and integrating data across the uh, sweet potato value chain to help to improve uh, value and mitigate waste or reduce waste um, in the sweet potato industry. The image that I'm showing here uh, is essentially a field of sweet potatoes that were essentially left out in the field. And these sweet potatoes were left out there because one, they were either misshaped and or defective. And it's known that these misshaped or defective sweet potatoes are gonna result in what we see here, increased food waste, but obviously also decreased value to the to the grower because that's the reason why they were left out there in the first place because you know they were uh, they could not be sold for any significant value. And then overall, you know, reduced uh, satisfaction to the consumer. So the question that we really pose as a part of this, of this project is that through large scale data integration, could we develop both novel optical and computational methods to identify factors that lend to or lead to defects in sweet potatoes, whether it's um, misshaped sweet potatoes or sweet potatoes that are ultimately defective or diseased. So this is really, again, a large scale um, data analytics project where our goal is to be able to collect large amounts of data, um, physiological data, um, partnering with an international sweet potato grower, obtaining information from an industrial scanner that they have. Now, this scanner can scan upwards of 100 to 150,000 sweet potatoes an hour. Um, this allows us to then garner or gather physical characteristics of the sweet potatoes. We also are uh, collecting data in terms of provenance data. Where did these sweet potatoes come from? What types of fields were they planted in? When were they planted? What is the soil chemistry? What was the weather associated uh, with these sweet potatoes over the planting and harvesting date? What types of fertilizers were used, et cetera? And through this large-scale data collection, our goal is to then create or develop supervised and unsupervised learning methods not only for classifying sweet potatoes based on shape and size, but also the development of machine learning approaches for predicting uh, the factors that contribute to, in this case, misshaped or defective sweet potatoes. 
So as part of this project, it really encompasses um, four main pillars, and not only from a research standpoint, but also from a stakeholder engagement standpoint and from a workforce development standpoint. Um, and we really take all of these, these components of this project you know, quite seriously in terms of um, providing a conduit um, to our stakeholders to assess and better understand the nature and specifics of their problems, and also facilitating, again, this, this uh, training and workforce development. But what I'm going to talk about here is more so the research components of the project, specifically strategic goals two and three, uh, which focuses, strategic goal two focuses on the development of next generation imaging systems for quantifying internal and external characteristics of sweet potato that impact value, and strategic goal three, which looks at creating a secure data management integration and analytics platform that will allow us to extract relationships across heterogeneous sweet potato data sets and provide decision support ultimately for the stakeholder. So in terms of uh, strategic goal two, this is led by one of my colleagues, um, Dr. Mike Hudnov in the ECE department. And one of the initial questions that we ask as part of this project is whether or not internal defect scanning of sweet potatoes can be done using interactive spectroscopy. And in terms of the initial um, steps for this project, uh, we wanted to really assess whether or not interactive spectroscopy, if, if we were to look at disease versus non-diseased or necrotic tissue, well, look at necrotic tissue versus non-diseased tissue, do we actually get a difference in the interacting spectrum? And what we were able to see here is that if you're looking specifically at the corresponding samples, we do actually see a difference, something that actually occurs around 925 nanometers. So, Given that we were able to initially see this, we wanted to then see whether or not this could be detected um, actually through the sweet potato skin. So um, what we were able to do is to establish an experimental setup where we looked at uh, the presence of necrosis at specific depths. Now, obviously the uh, specific depths that you would be able to have are gonna be somewhat limited because you're gonna be subject to the samples that you have. So what Dr. Kudinov was able to do was then to perform a ZMAX scattering simulation. So based on the data that he was able to obtain, um, perform a simulation where he was able to simulate different depths. And this is what um, we actually see here. And he was able to actually normalize this with respect to the 850 nanometer uh, wavelength and actually look at this and compare this to the, data, to the data that he originally obtained. And what we were able to see is that through both the data and also through the simulations, um, we were able to accurately detect a difference between the presence of necrotic tissue and the presence of um, non-necrotic tissue or the lack of non-necrotic tissue. Um, so thus measurements indicated that the necrotic tissue could be detected um, using, or could be detected by a relative increase at the 925 nanometer uh, spectra uh, compared to the 725 nanometer. Uh, the detection was reliable up to a depth of five millimeters. And this is with the laser probe being about eight and a half nanometers um, with a probe spacing, probe spacing of eight and a half nanometers. And this demonstrated the ability to use these types of, potentially use these types of technologies for high throughput scanning and potentially sorting and culling applications. Now, in terms of SG3, the data analytics and integration part, there were really two main aspects that we needed to put in place um, to really get this moving forward. And one was the automated data acquisition pipeline that allowed us to not only collect images from the scanner that I talked about earlier, um, but also collect um, and clean aspects of the agronomic data, and also having a place to store these data, uh, which we've established a uh, Postgres uh, database um, currently in a cloud environment that allows not only uh, us as researchers, but also um, the partners that we're working with as, as part of our stakeholder group to assess, access these data as well. Now, with these data in place, and the idea or the goal is to develop an analytics pipeline for both sweet potato classification and inference modeling. Um, and thus far, we've collected uh, data, sample data from uh, research stations in North Carolina um, to be able to, to do this effectively. So uh, the goal here is to be able to identify uh, accurate approaches for sweet potato classification and the development of machine learning approaches that allow us to assess the extent to which we can predict important characteristics of sweet potatoes from these provenance data. 
So in terms of the shape classification and quantification aspect, again, we were able to obtain data from um, two horticultural uh, research crop stations. Um, this totaled to about, I think about 50,000 um, sweet potatoes. This uh, sorter actually captures images of these sweet potatoes from two different directions, a front view and a side view. Using that front view and side view, we were able to generate a 3D replica of these sweet potatoes and from these 3D replica extract specific characteristics that we inferred could be useful in terms of classifying a good sweet potato from a bad sweet potato. This includes curvature, curve length, maximum diameter, cross section roundness, et cetera. We wanted to ensure that the measurements that we were actually approximating were accurate. So we then compared this um, to specific sweet potatoes by sampling a set of sweet potatoes and, as, and measuring what, how close we actually were using calipers. And we see here that our measurements or approximations were actually pretty accurate. From this, we were able to um, essentially assess or perform statistical analyses on how things like curvature or width changed across different sweet potato cultivars. Of those 50,000 images, we worked with the uh, sweet potato breeding program to actually label about a thousand of those images um, as either culls um, or US number ones, or in this case, high value sweet potatoes. Using those labeled sets, we wanted to essentially look at various uh, classification approaches to see which one um, could actually have reliable uh, classification of um, the specific sweet potato shape. And we found that uh, neural networks actually performed the best on our uh, testing set. Now, through this analysis, we actually found the that of the parameters that we, of the features that we identified, uh, specifically curvature and length to width ratio were, were particularly important in terms of distinguishing a good sweet potato from a bad sweet potato. So one of the goals here was to then assess to what extent could we predict things like curvature and length to width ratio from against provenance from again provenance data. So we looked at data from two sweet potato trials, uh, trials that were conducted in 2018 and 2019, and collected variables such as the field location, trial planting, um, and harvest date, soil tests, weather, plot number, and the corresponding plot location, etc and wanted to assess the extent to which machine learning approaches could be able to predict things like the mean plot curvature or the mean plot link to width ratio. And here, um, I'm just showing a few of the preliminary results that we have uh, where these are the results on 20% of the data um, that was used for testing. And we compared about nine different uh, machine learning approaches and actually saw or found that um, extra trees and gradient boost approaches um, really performed the best um, with in this case, an R squared of 66 and about 63 respectively. Now this actually says a lot, um, specifically given uh, the uh, limitations in the data that we have, particularly from a, a spatial sampling and a temporal sampling standpoint. Um, and our hope is that we'll be able to use this framework uh, when we actually start to collect more data. Also, one of the things that we found from these models is that we were able to then identify the specific factors that really contributed to um, its performance. And what this allowed us to identify or indicate is that specifically cultivar um, came out as an important variable in terms of being able to predict uh, mean length to width ratio and plot location. So, which tells us that there's something associated with these plots and where they are that's really contributing to the distinction of the corresponding link to width ratio. And this really also helps us to better understand how to um, then set up subsequent trials in terms of what needs to be potentially measured and what are the factors within those different plots that are contributing um, to these uh, factors such as link to width ratio. 
So in summary, I've gone over, again, several projects that we've looked at, uh, from dynamic modeling of minus FA response in Arabidopsis, um, to assess or using microscopy and computer vision to assess uh, interactions between stress response pathways for combined stress, um, methods for predicting bioenergy traits in poplar, um, and uh, computational approaches for identifying factors that contribute to sweet potato deformation. Uh, all of the work um, that I presented today was either uh, funded through uh, NSF, um, funded internally um, through NC State through the Game Changing Research Incentive uh, for, plant, for the Plant Sciences Initiative, or GRIP of PSI, and done in conjunction with industry partners such as um, SAS. Um, I would like to thank uh, some of my uh, former PhD students, uh, specifically uh, Dr. A uh, Alex Koryachko, Dr. Eli Buckner, Dr. Megan Matthews, and Dr. Samuel Hawk, who all worked on all of the different projects that I showed today. And of course, um, my collaborators across um, various departments um, at NC, inside and outside of NC State. And with that, I will take any questions. Okay, thank you. I'll wait for the virtual applause to die down, Kranos, but um, <laughs> plenty of hand claps happening there uh, on Zoom. Um, thank you very much. That was terribly impressive. Um, I'd like to open uh, the floor up for questions, if anyone would like to ask a question. Hello, Dr. Williams. Uh, I just wanted to ask uh, what ML techniques were used to map the uh, fluorescence uh, to the occurrence of genes that indicate uh, fluorescence. Uh, was there any, um, so how, how did you go from computer vision to, to knowing where the, the genes were? Because that was, I thought that was really impressive to, to see. <laughs> and so, and you, uh, I just showed you a name a second, Sarang? Yes. So, so are you talking about the imaging project? Yes. Yep. So could could you ask that one more time? I'm sorry. So uh, going from uh, the uh, looking at where the fluorescence is to generating uh, the image for where uh, the genes actually occur, uh, how was ML used uh, uh, for that step as well? So from uh, the first green image to the image with the uh, genes, the implications. Yes. So in terms of, so it was really a two-part problem. It was a segmentation problem and then it was a tracking problem. So for the segmentation, specifically watershed was used. So we used um, watershed method to be able to identify all of the individual regions. And then it became an image registration and tracking problem. So thus, given every unit or every region of expression that was identified, we then needed to one catalog each one of those and then in the subsequent image, perform a registration to assess which, which region in the subsequent frame was most likely or most likely belonged to or was the image or the region in the previous frame, and then be able to track this over time. And this essentially allowed us to then identify things that stayed over time things that emerged later on in time or things that completely disappeared in time. And all of this was also relative to the spacing, which was particularly important because these were confocal images. So thus we had a 3D representation of the overall location. So it's not just, for example, shifts in a 2D plane. We were able to then track these things over 3D and that also helped to improve our ability to link, um, be, link back to previous frames. Thank you, Dr. Williams. I'm a huge fan, by the way. I, I did my master's at NC State University, so I've always looked at your research uh, and, and been stunned by it. Oh, thank you. The, and also to follow up on, on your question, we did we have extended um, some of this work. So there's a, another project um, where we're actually tracking uh, expression in the phloem. Um, and in that particular case, there are things called companion cells. So there's expression in the phloem, and then there are things called companion cells, which have slightly different characteristics. And in that case, we actually had to not only identify the expression, but actually distinguish between a phloem cell and a companion cell. And in that particular case, we had to use um, some ML approaches to be able to make that distinction. 
Super, thank you. So that, that actually uh, segues very nicely into a question that's in the chat, Kramos, um, from uh, Jesse Horn. Uh, he, uh, they say, uh, great talk, thank you. Um, for the sweet potato shape imaging neural network, was that a convolutional neural network? Um, and they comment this typically performs well for image related tasks, uh, so they were curious. And yes. then I guess just to follow, so yes is the answer there. And then to follow up. No, no, up, no, no, the oh. answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> so, okay, so the answer is no. And then yeah. as a follow up, um, they asked, what do you see as the most significant challenge in bringing machine learning to the plant biology world? Okay, that's a very good question. So in terms of the uh, initial models that we used, so let's see, no. There we go. In terms of the initial models that we use, we actually did not use a um, convolutional neural network in this case. Um, we did explore a couple of different architectures, but one of the things that um, we are running into problems with is the uh, number of ground truth data that we have. Um, and like I said, we had about a thousand images. Now. Uh, it, the truth is that we were lucky to get that because they were, you know, on their ability to label image 999, you know, they were getting pretty tired of going through and, and labeling these images, um, which actually really limits um, the type of, of complex architectures that we can that we can use. And remember, with this, we didn't use the images themselves. We used uh, features that were extracted from the 3D replica. Now, if we can get more labeled images, more ground truth, then this really opens the door to being able to use more complex uh, machine learning approaches, um, whether it's uh, convolutional neural networks, whether it's other deep learning approaches, et cetera. And that honestly becomes one of the primary limitations um, and you asking one of the primary limitations that we have. Now we're actually working on addressing this uh, so what we're doing now is we're working on creating essentially a labeling tool that we can actually distribute to uh, various stakeholders, whether it's to uh, members of the sweet potato breeding program or even um, to the uh, sweet potato packer themselves. And what we have honestly hypothesized is that how someone in the breeding program looks at a high value sweet potato is actually going to be slightly different than say how a packer looks at you know a high value sweet potato, and with this tool, it's going to be web based. It's going to be you know allow us to distribute it. Uh, we've talked to them in terms of what is the best setup um, to make it as easy as possible for them, and the hope is that it'll just allow them to to look at an image, click, look at an image, click, look at an image, click, and run through all of the images in our database and have a score store that those ground truth. And my hope is that with those additional data, it'll kind of open up what we're able to do in terms of these types of analyses. Fantastic, thank you. Yeah, that that, that limitation of uh, label data is certainly something that's the subject of a lot of conversations within AI farms. Um, okay, well, I think we can squeeze in one more uh, question <laughs> from the chat here. Uh, Joseph asks, uh, your analysis took into consideration gene expression for the most part, for in, in the first application. Um, if we need to bring in the other omics counterparts, for example, metabolomics, proteomics, how will this impact um, the approaches? The answer is it likely will. <laughs> um, so uh, an example of that is gonna be, uh, for example, with the type of work that we did with the Lignin project. Um, and the fact, uh, the the work that I presented there, um, I presented it as a very uh, contiguous and you know flowing you know type of process. But that thing was it was a beast. It it, it was about five to six years of overall work and data collection, et cetera, um, testing different hypotheses, collecting data, looking at uh, looking at metabolomic data and seeing how it con contradicted with everything that we thought. Um, and, you know, really working with my counterparts to, to formulate strategies of integration. And with respect to that first project, I think it would honestly be the same exact way. Um, you know, we just have a glimpse of the transcriptional activity 
um, that's going on. And the fact is that, you know, when you start to incorporate not only uh, metabolomic data, but also enzyme data, you start to see very different things. We, we have one project where we're not only looking at transcriptome data, but we're also looking at ribos, um, riboseq, so basically translational data. And the idea there and what we're finding is that the relationships that you see at the transcriptional level are not necessarily the relationships that you see at the translational level. And things can honestly not be transcribed or not have a differential transcription, but actually have quite an impact at the translational level. So I think when you start to incorporate these data, you just have to make sure to keep these things in mind and start to identify and generate the types of tools that will help you to further continue to ask these questions. So, I mean, and, and I know that that's not a clear and cut um, answer um, to your question, um, but honestly, it's, it's carefully um, kind of seeing what is um, consistent, what is inconsistent with some of the analyses that you've done, and then exploring the types of questions that need to be asked. Cool. Well, thank you very much. I, we, we've got a number of other questions in the chat, but we're, we're past one o'clock. And so I'm, I'm really sorry to those who had extra questions for Kranos. Um, maybe you can contact him by email or if you're uh, in scheduled for one of his subsequent meetings, I hope you, you might get a chance to ask them there. But um, Thank you very much for the uh, the interest um, and the engagement. And uh, thank you again to you, Kranos, for a, a really excellent seminar. Absolutely. And again, um, hopefully, uh, uh, Andrew, if, if everyone has my email, you, we're more than, I'm more than welcome to pick up um, these conversations um, at a later time. Just email me and, and I'll love to, to schedule a time to meet. Fantastic. That's very kind. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a good afternoon.